Buon pomeriggio, good afternoon. I'm going to turn into English because the panel is all in English. And uh, I'm glad to see such a full room for revenue management. We're going to speak and talk about revenue management. You're going to see a 25 minutes keynote from, from one of the most inno innovative companies of, uh, of the game of revenue management. I introduce Nathalian Green from Duetto. Hi, everyone. My name is Nat Green, and I'm here with Duetto. I'm a senior global solutions engineer for the company, and I'm here to talk to you guys about the revenue strategy gap. What do I mean by revenue strategy? Now, revenue management has traditionally been a department that's siloed within an organization. You'll have operations, sales and marketing, revenue management, and loyalty that are often dealt in complete different silos within an organization. Decision making is all done within those departments, not a lot of cross communication within the organization. The hotel industry is shifting from a siloed organization structure into an integrated organization. And we call this revenue strategy. And where we see, or where Duetto stands on this, is that revenue management is really the cornerstone of this integrated department of revenue strategy across the entire organization. So um, revenue management is now shifting to this revenue strategy structure. And really, revenue managers are becoming data managers. There's so much data at hotels. And traditionally, revenue managers have been using this data to output a price. And now, there's so much data that operations, sales and marketing, and other departments can use similar data to be able to figure out outputs for their own departments. So conversion is a hot, uh, it's a hot data point that often is talked about within sales and marketing and revenue management. Now, what is conversion? Traditionally, when we think of conversion, we think of web conversion. And that's the amount of people that book over the amount of people that make it through your booking engine. Now, traditionally in the industry, when we think of good conversion, we think of roughly 8 to 15%. For any of you guys who are hotels, your booking engine, if you get an 8 to 15% conversion rate, you'd be really excited about that. And what's really interesting is you know, revenue managers lose a lot of data by only looking at converted business. It's almost like the tip of the iceberg. Your 8 to 15% is that top portion. And the data that you lose of your non-converted business gets thrown away. So when you're forecasting pricing or demand, you're only looking at that 8 to 15% from last year, from last week, and from last month. And you're throwing away that 85 to 92% of the data. We'll get back to that uh, shortly. So now, what impacts conversion? There's four major factors that impact conversion. First is the pricing. Are you pricing the property correctly? The second is the distribution channel usability, be it Hotel Tonight, Expedia, or your booking engine. When a customer comes onto your platform, how usable is it? Is it interactive? And is it something that would make it very easy for them to book? Uh, next is the ad placement or demographic targeting. So making sure that the sales and marketing team is putting the right customers onto your website. And then last, you take those first three, and you want to make sure that the timing is correct. So you want to make sure the right, uh, the right price is in front of the customer at the right time. Similar factors don't just impact your conversion, but impact your overall demand also. And what's interesting is, as I mentioned before, Traditionally, because of these silos, this one metric, conversion and demand, is managed by three separate departments with three separate goals. Revenue management, distribution, and sales and marketing. And now, over the past 20 years, the distribution landscape has gotten significantly more complex. And what do I mean by that? Expedia came about in the late 1990s. Kayak has come about, along with other meta search sites. And the distribution landscape is getting more and more complex. Facebook now even offers the ability to make bookings directly on Facebook. Google released a study saying that uh, the average customer goes between 38 and 42 sites between making a booking. That means outside of the hotel, there's 38 to 42 people or companies competing for that money from the customer. That makes it more and more complex to make sure that you can control the cost of acquisition for any given customer. And what's interesting is once the customer finally makes it to that booking platform, some book and some don't. It's conversion. Now, 
this uh, complexity in the distribution landscape has created this internal struggle between third-party distribution and direct bookings, something that's been talked about at a lot of conferences, the rise of the OTAs, you know, how come they can control so much market share, why do customers end up booking with them rather than booking direct? So this conversion battle and this demand battle is really between third-party booking and your direct booking. So traditionally, hotels, uh, travelers book through the stay brand. So back before online travel became popular, you generally either had a travel agent or you called the hotel personally, and you'd reach out directly to the hotel that you're staying in. But over the past 20 years, that's shifted, and there's been a bifurcation in regards to how customers will interact uh, with the hotel. And this rise of the booking brands, as we call it, the TripAdvisors, Kayaks, Googles, Pricelines, has become this intermediary that goes from customer reaching directly to the hotel to that 38 to 42 steps before finally making a booking. Now, what's interesting is the top booking brands, these uh, Expedias, Googles, and everyone else, they're using data properly. They've already shifted this mentality of data management to optimize their demand and their conversion. So they're already thinking about that 85 to 92 percent. They've been doing something about it. They've been using targeted advertisements. They've integrated their marketing department with the pricing department within their organization to best target consumers. And guess what that's led to? Oh. Clicker's not working. Perfect. Um, so a study, an attribution study by the University in Maryland uh, in the United States did an analysis of booking patterns. And what they found is that between 2012 and 2014, there's been roughly the same amount of proportion of customers that visit intermediary sites versus customers that'll visit a hotel site to make a booking. What's interesting about this is over those same two years, you could see that visits exclusively to hotel sites have gone down 2%. Visits to exclusively intermediary sites have gone up 12%, and visits to both hotel and intermediary have gone down by 10%. So that 85 to 92%, that non-converted business, the booking brands are really taking advantage of to be able to drive consumers to book directly through them rather than booking on your uh, booking engine. And what's interesting, so if we look, this represents 82% of total visits of those customers that go to those third-party channels. And this represents the 18% of people that go to hotels. They did a forecasting study. And here you could see that for uh, guests that go through the intermediaries, they've done a pretty good job for people that go to Expedia to maintain staying on Expedia or similar third-party uh, third distribution. And those uh, customers that go to hotels, the hotels have gone, done a pretty good job of actually shifting down that uh, guest going from a hotel to intermediary by 5%. The problem with that, though, is the bulk of consumers, 82%, stick with that third-party distribution. What that's led to is you see this ratio of direct to indirect. Back in 2011, inside of the US, 4 .3, uh, there was 4.3 direct bookings for every one indirect booking. And over the, past, uh, over the five years leading to 2015, that number's gone down to 2.7 direct bookings to one indirect booking. So the OTAs, these third-party distribution partners, are doing a very, very good job of attracting customers and increasing the total number of bookings. And as you can see, if we use New York City as an example, since 2012, the OTAs have been the largest demand driver within this certain market. So it's really hard to be competing with the OTAs for a couple big reasons. The primary one, they spend a lot on marketing. They're marketing powerhouses. They're very good at getting that consumer into the door uh, that for the first time visit especially, but the guests like their booking process. They become loyal to Expedia because the booking process is very easy. But you could see in 2013, uh, Expedia and Priceline and other OTAs spent 3.5 billion on online travel relative to 800 million by the hotel company. So they spend four times more on marketing. That hasn't changed. In 2005, or 2015, Booking.com and Expedia have spent almost $6 billion on marketing. It's a lot. It's hard to, it's hard to compete with. So now what happens when third-party distribution owns market demand? Commissions increase. So any of you guys at hotels know that your commissions have been going up. It might have been 15% a few years ago, it might be 20% today. 
and this is between 2009 and 2012, commissions have been going up at twice the rate of revenue. That hasn't stopped. Between 2012 and 2015, commissions have actually gone up three times. So now, how can hotels stay competitive in a landscape where OTAs are spending significantly more money on marketing, significantly more investment in trying to get the consumer to book through them, relative to uh, hotels, which are much more limited and fragmented, especially independent hotels? Creating brand loyalty. So now, Focus Right ran a study uh, on the top three drivers of brand loyalty. The first one, it's easy to shop and find what I'm looking for on its website. The second, it offers a better price or value. And the third, it's reliable. I haven't had problems. So now revenue management needs to stay very involved within these three processes. And this goes back to my point, it's revenue strategy, not revenue management. You need to consider the revenue managers, not just the data keepers to figure out a price, but the data keepers to really help the entire organization. So let's start with this top one. Oh. Um, and revenue management can help bridge that consumer loyalty gap. It's very difficult to say, okay, we want to create a loyalty program. How do we really incentivize these guests? So we'll start with this first one. It's easy to shop and find what I'm looking for on the website. This goes back to my first point about just basic web conversion. You look at tools like Hotel Tonight relative to and, or old booking engines that are very uh, under, under invested in regards to the website, Hotel Tonight, within three clicks, you can make a booking. Three clicks, you could find any amount of information you want. Within three clicks, you could do anything that you need to within the booking process to make a decision. If you go onto most hotels' websites, it takes a lot more than three clicks to be able to figure out and make your finalized booking. This is something that revenue management needs to constantly monitor. Your booking engine isn't a buy it and have it be done and sitting there in the corner for five years. It's a constant evolution. You need to constantly be thinking about and monitoring this booking conversion to figure out what's the best structure for capitalizing and optimizing your conversion. The next, it offers a better price or value. So loyalty pricing has become a hot topic, especially from the big brands like Marriott and Hilton in the United States over the past six months. Now, it started in Las Vegas as a concept of reinvestment. If you were to go and gamble and spend you know, 500 US dollars, 1,000 US dollars in a Las Vegas casino, they reinvest in you. They give you a free room. They'll give you a free meal. They'll even fly you out if you're a whale and you spend a lot of money gambling at the casino. Now, the big brands have taken note of that, and they've realized the average hotel guest doesn't spend what the average casino guest does, but you can still take that overall top-line revenue, or whatever metric you want to track, and reinvest in that guest. And what that's led to is personalized pricing. So you'll have each of your different customers, and they spend on a spa, they spend on uh, F&B revenue, they buy the highest level room, uh, your top suite. Each one can be given a daily worth. And based on that worth, you can then reinvest and give a discount to the customer. Now, what this enables you to do is offer the best price direct to the customer rather than through all of your different channels. And this mitigates rate parity because this is a fenced rate. You would need your guests to be able to log on to the booking engine rather than just finding a public rate. They log on. The, uh, the booking engine recognizes them and gives them that customized price, that guaranteed discount that is going to be better than anything that they will find through third party or even their direct channels if they're not a loyalty customer. So you could see here, Jay, if you base it on F&B spend, spa spend, golf, ancillary revenues, uh, he has a $99 average non-room spend. His discount might be 9% off of your retail rate. You could base it off of stay nights if he consistently comes a certain number of nights, and maybe he gets a set discount of 20 euros every stay or every night that he stays. You can base it on effectively anything that you know based on your customer, either repeat visits or total spend or total lifetime value. You can reinvest as you guys see fit. Now, what's scary is the third-party distribution, OTAs and other channels, are actually investing in this loyalty programs also. And you know what that means? The hotels are not the only ones now competing for price and conversion on their websites. The OTAs are too. And because they can invest so much in marketing, it becomes really hard to compete with that. And that's what makes this last point extra important. It's reliable and I haven't had problems. 
Um, so you can see room rate and website design impacts booking conversion. It's a huge, it impacts demand also. It's a huge driver to get those customers foot in the door or to even have repeat guests. Now, when you think about this booking path, as it gets more and more complex, conversion isn't just a first time interaction. Guests come back, guests come a second time, a third time, a fourth time. Hotels are so caught up in thinking about their web conversion and just upping that 8% to a 9% or to a 10%, they're not really thinking about the other form of conversion, which is that second time that a guest stays, do they book direct, even though they might have booked through Expedia that first time? So now we'll go to this last point. Is it reliable and I have it at problems? This is really where the hotels can stand out. But now, really, haven't had problems is the benchmark for guest loyalty. You've gone to a hotel, and it's not that they've gone above and beyond. It's that they haven't had problems. I find that personally crazy. So there's a famous quote by Henry Ford. If I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Guests don't realize what you can do and the power of the data that the hotel has to enhance that guest experience. And this is really where revenue managers can help fire up the entire other departments to use data in the most strategic ways. What I call this is operational conversion. That chart of that 4.3 direct bookings per one indirect and that shift to 2.7 to one is operational conversion. It's an operational conversion ratio. So I believe that there's so much emphasis on the shop and buy, you don't put that much emphasis on the return. You don't think the OTAs are great marketing tools, as they claim they are, which they are. And just because they get a guest in the door for that first time, it means that your operation and revenue team needs to capitalize on the fact that the guest is there to ensure that they book direct the next time. So as I mentioned, this was the... Uh, Convert operational conversion ratio. So now engagement is the new loyalty. You know, everyone's talking about millennials. I am a millennial. <laughs> um, but if you think about it, what do they want from a brand? They want authenticity and they want engagement on social media. So this is something sales and marketing can generally manage. And what do they want from a loyalty program? Easy to join, uh, sign in with Facebook on your booking engine, and the most important one to revenue management, unique, relevant, and unexpected rewards. Now, how can you do that? Uh, before I go there, what is the worst question that you can think of to ask a repeat guest? This is your first time staying with us. When you've stayed at the same hotel, the same hotel brand, and you've had the same actions at this hotel, the same consumption of food, the same trends at the property, they should know that about you already. So we could do a quick case study of roommate hotels. Uh, I personally always go to the roommate Aitana in Amsterdam, probably my favorite hotel on earth. Um, and I always ask for a specific view. Let's say I, on average, spend around $50 per stay on room service, spend around $30 per stay at the lobby bar, always request a toothbrush kit or a razor. Uh, I normally consume all the Coca-Cola Zeros within the mini bar every time I stay, um, and a few other of these. Uh, so I prefer to have the bill email, to skip checkout, and a few more operational, uh, strategy, or operational things that I prefer. So if we look at this, these are all data points that hotels are collecting for a guest. But every time I go to the roommate Aitana, they ask me, welcome, is this your first time in Amsterdam? And every time I sit there going, oh my gosh, I wouldn't be booking through a third-party channel at either a cheaper rate or the same rate if they knew all of these things about me and were reinvesting in me as a customer, if they knew to stock my minibar personally with a little bit more Coke Zero than maybe some other beverages, if they knew that every time that I stay at the property, I try to skip checkout so they could put the bill under my door and just let me walk out of the hotel. So there's a huge amount of operational opportunity that revenue management can work with your sales and marketing and or your operations department to really figure out the most strategic ways to reinvest in your guests to show them that you know them. Because if you show them that you know the guest, they're going to book direct rather than booking through that third party channel. So I strongly advise, don't let just the booking process drive guest loyalty. And to this point, that's what it's been. It's been the shop and the buy that's instigated, that's gotten the customers to go, you know what? It's an easy purchasing uh, process. You go to a hotel tonight, the credit card's already connected, you pick a hotel, you book, and that's it. 
If that's the biggest incentive for customers to drive loyalty, the hotels have been doing something wrong, especially because the OTAs, there's no customer interaction, whereas when you're a hotel, you have multiple points at check-in throughout the entire stay that you as the property can get to know the customer and understand what they want. And understanding what they want drives that operational conversion. So it's our goal to flip the chart and change the course of the industry. We're at 2.7 in uh, direct bookings for every one indirect booking today. We need to get it back to 4.3. We need to increase that number even more. And having your operations team integrated with your revenue management team can really show that you invest in loyalty and you understand your customer. Because just because the OTAs can use or your third-party distribution can understand that lost business or that 85 to 92% of customers, you understand the customer significantly more than they do. They understand their online traffic patterns. You understand their stay experience. And at the end of the day, customers stay at hotels for an experience, not just for their web traffic patterns. So it's revenue strategy, not revenue management. Um, and just know that revenue management should not be siloed within your organization. And if it is, start having the conversations to break apart those silos. Start having senior executive meetings with operations, sales and marketing, revenue and loyalty integrated to make sure that revenue managers are not just thought of take data and pump out a price, but take data from the entire organization. How do you re reinvest in loyalty customers? How can you price in the most dynamic and strategic of ways? And how can you make sure that at the end of the day, profit optimization is aligned with the entire organization rather than the incentives within each siloed department? So with that, uh, I thank you guys very much. Thank you, Natalia. That was a lot, a lot of things. Have a seat. You sit here. You sit here. Oh. And uh, we invite on stage the other two talkbacker. We start with Paul Van Merendok from Ideas. Hello, Paul. Thank you. And uh, an old friend of BTO since uh, he was here since the very first edition in 2008. Please welcome back at BTO Andrew Morsi from Red Tiger. And you, you're late. I didn't expect that from an expert of a technically late. <laughs> Hello. Uh. Thank you. So, uh, I'm doing the part of the hotelier here. As you know, I'm an hotelier as well. So, I have a, a, lo a lot of questions that came in mind. But first of all, Paul, you have a question for Nathaniel after his keynote. What do you yeah. think about his idea? Yeah. First of all, thank you for having me. I think it's great to be here. Um, Nathaniel, I um, just wanted to ask you, I think, fully uh, on board with your concept of personalized pricing. I think that's the way things are headed. I'm just wondering, you know, for the, you know, there are a lot of independent hotels here in Italy, and uh, you know, they're obviously trying to combat what you outlined there in terms of the OTA power, you know, whether it's booking.com or, or some of the other sites out there. How are the hotels here going to implement personalized pricing if there's, the market is so dominated by these OTAs? So at the end of the day, you know, I think that the OTAs, especially for independent hotels, are great partners because it's very difficult for smaller properties to be able to drive the demand or get the eyes you know, from a guest in Vietnam or a guest in Shanghai or a guest you know, in other parts of the world especially to get visibility onto your property. But I think that's especially where smaller organizations need to focus that much more on the operational conversion. I think that, yes, that first time that a guest stays, you should try to track as much information about them, show that when they check out that you're very enthusiastic about them wanting to come back to try to incentivize them to book direct that next time. Um, but at the end of the day, it is somewhat more of a challenge for the independent properties to be able to combat with these OTAs. Um, but if they can put more emphasis on this operational conversion, yes, the OTAs might be the biggest driver of first interactions with your property, but if your operations and revenue team can really work together, they can shift to make sure that there's a significantly better direct to indirect ratio for second or third time guests. I, before we go on, I, I asked the... Uh, posso avere la luce in sala? Vorrei vedere un attimo la sala. Grazie. Vorrei sapere, alzate la mano, quanti di voi utilizzano un programma di revenue management? Abbastanza, eh? 
però quanti albergatori ci sono in sala? We can, we can say at least uh, uh, half of the room is hoteliers and they use uh, revenue management tools 30%, which is, uh, uh, I have to say, from the very first BTO from uh, nine years ago, the percentage has gone up a lot. So, Andrew, uh, I remember since the very first time, the early times of BTO, you were saying that the future of revenue management was not there. Right. Uh, but, but it seems that it's still here, and in, in a different way, moving sure. way, different, different kind of revenue, different product. Right. Uh, uh, so what's your impression on that? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much <laughs> and congratulate you on your team and your success. Uh, I've been here nine years ago, and I see a huge difference, a huge success. Thank you very much. Grazie. Um, Actually, what I would like to say initially is we need to define the difference between channel management, being an owner of a channel management company, and revenue management system. So basically, the revenue management system have evolved. However, it bases a lot of its core on forecasting, taking the history to do pricing for the future, um, which was a great thing 15 years ago uh, because the market was static, was similar, mimicking each other. So I could easily take my history, juggle it, and make a forecast either by algorithm or even in Excel spreadsheet. Uh, however, we all know that uh, tour operators are growing and growing, and most of our buyers becoming really shoppers, not really buyers, which means you could use your history as much as you want to forecast future. However, the customer doesn't care about that. Or the buyer is a looker, which means they go online a lot and they will never buy a hotel just straight like that because it's still we need to compare it. Even if they like the hotel and they've been there before, they still need to know that they are not paying or overpaid. So I actually noted a few questions I need to ask the, the crowd. The crowd? Uh, you want to ask them? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I need to ask them a few questions. I don't need answers, but I need you to think about the answers. Um, one of them, what's the percentage of your online business versus direct business? This is a key question because I need to know who's shopping and who's coming to me directly. And I'm sure all of you as a hotelier know that. That's a good question for Italian hoteliers. Well, Giancarlo, let's, uh, look, let's get them to clap. So yeah. clap right. if you know the percentage of your online direct versus indirect Applaudite business. Applaudite se sapete la percentuale dei vostri clienti diretti o indiretti online. Okay. So Next, they, know, the they know it. They know it. Good. <laughs> the second question, would, would a buyer buy your hotel? based in your history at all, or based in your current pricing versus your competitors? Would I come, because when you think about it, to say I'm an RMS and I made a calculation to forecast the future, and based on that future of calculation, I put a price, 100 euros. Would people come and buy you because of this, or will buy you because you have a good price versus your competition? Avete capito la domanda? Quindi se eh, il vostro programma vi dice di, di fare una certa tariffa eh, e voi mettete quella tariffa eh, e vi comprano perché è la tariffa giusta o perché è la tariffa giusta contro i vostri competitor? Vi comprano perché è la tariffa giusta? Applaudite! Vi comprano perché è la tariffa giusta contro i vostri competitor? Applaudite! So it's more, it's more a competition game for, for, for most of the audience. All right. The third one is... <clears throat> That's the first time that we, we are doing uh, interviewing the audience, but it's good. <laughs> the third question is, assuming you have an RMS, RMS basically take the history. What, what is RMS? Lot revenue of... management system. Okay. Revenue management system. Yeah. In, prov provate a immaginare che avete un programma di revenue management, o se ce l'avete... Um, and I have a history 
which I take and juggle and make a forecast, correct? Bene, lui fa la storia e fa una previsione. So, Questo programma fa una storia e fa una previsione. In that case, I should assume that the history or the person who's working before who made that history is very accurate and did everything correctly. Otherwise, we will go with the concept of garbage in, garbage out. So, unless devo, my history... devo presumere che la persona che ha fatto tutta quella ricerca insieme al, al programma di revenue management abbia fatto il suo lavoro molto, molto correttamente. Uh, the next one is from my own experience in hotels. We always tracked our market segment based on reason of a trip. Corporate, leisure, group, and so on, and we break them down into sub-segments. I, I think I can ask very well this one. Fate ancora una segmentazione di mercato, leisure contro corporate, ragioni del viaggio. Battete le mani se la fate ancora. Yeah, no. But some of them, they don't have headset, so I'll do it. <laughs> uh, yes, they okay. do. Uh, still leisure against corporate, which is one of the questions that is still true yeah. or not. Of course, it's, uh, it's not true, because would you care if I'm a shopper coming to your hotel next Tuesday? Would you care if I'm coming to attend a funeral or coming for a meeting or coming to see a doctor? Or would you care that I am able and capable to buy that room at this price? Which means market segment is good to track source of business but it's totally against revenue management because revenue management, you should track your pockets of people who can and afford to buy your hotel at this price. Hmm. So it's a little different. Both are good and useful. However, in reality, if I have a 10-room hotel, I need to know how many people or how many rooms I could sell at 200 euros how many I could sell at 300, how many I could sell at 400, in order to take the base business and upsell on it and get higher and higher. Otherwise, I'll come, if I use the history in that case, I'll take the same five people with 50 euros and I start to yield, and that will increase your revenue by a very small percentage. But you will never really make a big difference. Right. So I i, yeah. I need to, to see the opinion of Paul, yeah, about <laughs> He has opened a lot, a lot of windows on, on yeah, the problem. I, I think um, in reality, you know, there is probably some middle ground between, I think, some of the things that Nathaniel was saying and some of the things Andrew was saying about what historically happened. I think nowadays um, the importance is, is personalized pricing is definitely the way to go, that's kind of where the future lies, I think. But in order to get there, we need to be realistic and think about where are we at today, what's the data that we have available, and how are people booking, and what are they looking at? So in order to do that, I think it's a combination of, of all these factors. And if you look at uh, most of the hotels here, you know, they're working with the OTAs, and they get direct bookings, they need to take all these different sources into account. And so I think we believe that there's some middle ground there about using the data that's available in the industry right now to make the right decisions. So integrating with things like TravelClick or STR or uh, reputation data, which is very important now, using those data sources to complement some of the, the, the challenges that Andrew was outlining. It's not just about historical data, it's also about what's happening in the market. So putting those two together is really going to be the powerful uh, vehicle right now that hotels can use to uh, optimize their revenues. We have an audience question. Sure. Luciano. Oh, that's hi, a good hi, question. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm Andrew, sure. welcome back. Thank uh, you. Paul, pleased to uh, see you. Thank and you. Nathaniel, um, I've been listening very uh, carefully to your uh, uh, keynote and I enjoyed it very much. Andrew, I, I really like to, to hear you speaking because uh, every time it's kind of uh, food for our thoughts. And uh, what I really liked was your uh, last question in terms of, do you, still, do you really care uh, the reason your guest is coming to your hotel or would you care about uh, 
the spending power, actually. The, the correct answer will be the spending power is what we care most. But on the other hand, can you help us understand and determine how would you uh, try to understand the spending power if you don't keep uh, market segmenting your customers somehow? And this, uh, um, I'm sure you will give us a very brilliant answer. And on the other hand, so I'll have uh, just this uh, break once. Uh, Nathaniel, I really liked your, um, your keynote and especially liked the part where you were talking about guest loyalty, which is actually what makes the difference between a customer and a purchaser. So in hotel business, we, everybody wants customers, I believe. But in these days, when it's so hard to be loyal to, your, to the company you've been working for, because nowadays you change them every so often, it's so hard to be even loyal to your partner, to your wife, or whatever you have, that everybody else has. And it's so difficult to be loyal to any kind of brand. How can you nowadays expect a customer to be loyal to your hotel? I mean, if I, I, I keep going to London every year, and every time I change the hotel because I want a new experience. So please help me in understanding this. Okay, All right. we have two questions. Should we do the two first questions. one? And then Andrew, the second? you, you okay. do first. Uh, basically, um, we end up doing business to sell rooms. And we sell it at the best price for us. So the reason of a trip is, is, is good to track the business to know where I can penetrate from. I can get more business from. But however, I cannot forecast. Uh, I have a five rooms coming next week and all coming for funeral. It doesn't make any sense. But I can forecast five rooms willing and able to pay 250 euros. So both segments are valid. However, from my past experience, uh, when I went to a chain, I said, OK, let's show me your market segment. It was all, as usual, based on reason of a trap. However, when I changed it, uh, the percentage of growth went up from 3 4% to 20-something percent. Again, I need to know how many people able and willing to buy my hotel at how much, which is that what I'm in business to do, not to know why they are coming for the trap. And it's all culture. We've been doing it for so many years. Change is difficult, but it's a must. Right. Nathaniel? So, you know, I think that loyalty should be almost treated similar to how Google or Facebook treats advertisements. You know, Google and Facebook are very targeted with how they advertise, and it's how they can make a lot of money because they incentivize small and big companies to advertise on their platforms because they know their consumer and they could put the right advertisement in front of the right consumer to make sure that the company is getting the most out of their advertising dollars. Um, you know, I think similar is, can be said with loyalty, and I think that nothing has really been done in regards to operational investment to understand, you know, what do customers want, and how can you really target the most perfect experience for that guest, and I think it's going to be a trial and error process. I think that naturally there are going to be customers that will want to go to multiple different hotels, even if you target their exact needs, because they just are out and about, and they want to be testing a lot of different properties. But I think that as we start to see these operational investments in loyalty, you're going to start to see that a lot of customers are not going to feel that need to go to these other experiences because their ideal experience is being provided by the hotel company that knows them the best. Right. I have a, oh, sorry. Paul. Uh, sorry, yeah, if I could just say, um, I think, you know, for the, the big brands and for the big online channels, loyalty is great because they'll have customers that book at different hotels across the world and be able to focus on those customers. I think for some of the smaller chains or independent hotels, that may be quite challenging because they may not have that many repeat guests. They will certainly have some, but they may not be their core business. So I think the way the, the industry is moving now is there are a lot of tools available for hotels that allow them to understand the traffic that's coming to their websites, what is their customer, what's their intent, why are they booking. So if they are visiting a funeral for a funeral or things like this, there are ways now that the data can show that information. There's a company called Insights, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, sure. that actually tracks that type of data. And that can be very useful in making revenue management decisions because you know where your customers are coming from, what is their intent, how likely are they to book 
for a certain day, and what are the reasons why they're booking. So it's actually moving beyond some of the more traditional ways of, of loyalty or, or uh, history to really using the, the, the data that's out there in the market. So there's some great new tools coming out. Nathan. I just wanted to add one point. So there was a comment before about uh, you know, uh, using historical data is not necessarily the most accurate in regards to forecasting the future. Uh, I think Andrew is very accurate about that statement. We are in an era of unprecedented uncertainty. We are dealing with the ramifications of Brexit, the ramifications of the Trump election, the ramifications of the referendum here in Italy. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of uh, security issues with all the terrorism that's happening within the region as well. So using your historical data is not necessarily going to be accurate in regards to forecasting your future. And I see revenue management and the future of revenue management systems. And I think uh, you know, Duetto as a company was founded over the last four years. Uh, so this has really been uh, one of our principles, is revenue management's like driving a car. Now your historical data is like looking in the rear view mirror. You're going to be looking back to see you know, what happened in the past to get an idea of you know, what could be coming in the future. Your competitor pricing and your review scores are like looking in your side view mirrors. What's going on to the left of you? What's going on to the right of you? But you can't drive a car without that front view mirror. So there's data sources like travel click, future demand data, air traffic pattern demand, conversion for you know, three months from now. What's your conversion on the third Tuesday of March of 2017? Have, How does it relate to I have to a yep. follow-up question and then an audience question. But if independent hoteliers, you say, they're spending too much money paying higher commissions to OTAs, if they got really good at data mining and data management, SEO and bidding, and subscribing to 16 different serv ser uh, services Service. and forecasting and have geolocated services to know when people check in and PMS data intersect, Coke Zero or Coke This, guess what? Their uh, cost of going direct would go way, way up. So it's, uh, th there's two sides, is the comment. Uh, audience question. Hi, Angelo Lariccia, One Hotels. Hi, everybody. Hi, Andrew. Mm -hmm. I know all, all of you. I know all of your products so, because we are on the market like you. The, my, my question is, uh, how does your product or your strategies relate with the, the product that other providers, for instance, Booking.com, Booking Suite, and so on, are putting into the market? In the sense that uh, one of the key points that they for sure have, more than maybe other players, is the fact that uh, Due to the wide uh, diffusion, they do know better than maybe than anybody else the pressure on a destination on a certain date. That's a that's a nice question because they, yeah. they use this information as a pressure. I uh, come to me. I have a, the good revenue management product because I know the pressure of the market better than anyone else. Correct. Um, RMSs usually don't know the pressure of the market. Mm -hmm. Um, websites do know because they have so many hotels by every star rating and they can see the clicks coming and the demand is coming and actually some of them ended up doing their own revenue management by whenever you give them 100 euros and they keep on putting it up based on the high demand which is somehow unethical but this is done um, however in my case as example we are uh, having a product where you can really, in a region or in a city, we can track how many people book in, in these hotels, in these star ratings, and we can help the hotels with that. Because that's the key, really. And the knowledge, instead of being in the past, is becoming knowledge of the future and the present. And that's the decision-making uh, key, actually. Uh, so you see your, your, your demand is coming on a certain day. You could see it for others before you and you act accordingly before it's too late. And, and more and more you act faster, more and more you can capture that demand of the market. I, yeah, so I, I would agree with important. Andrew. I think there's so much information out there and so many data sources available. Do you really want to put all your eggs in one basket and have booking.com tell you what's happening and make those decisions for you. I think hotels and hotel operators and owners want to control their own inventory, make their own pricing decisions based on all the information and data that's out there available to them. And I think a lot of the systems that are out there integrate now with data sources that go beyond even what booking.com can do because they tap into all the different channels that are out there and your own inventory. 
So it's a combination of that and that control that you have over your own inventory that gives that power back to the hotels rather than giving it to the OTAs. Right. I, I have a qu another question for you. Uh, let's talk about uh, the home shares accommodation. Now, I mean, it's the big thing around. You, you can smell it, you can feel it. So should hotels really care about the accom home accommodation demand in certain city? Here in Florence, for example, the statistics say that we have probably nearly 9,000 uh, homes on selling on the different websites, Airbnb, HomeAway, and uh, One Fine Stay, and so on. So Shell, I think it's something that hotels should care of, starting with Paul. Uh, definitely, I think it's something that is impacting the market. It's something new, something people are trying out. It may be for a certain segment of the market. I don't think everybody is going to use an Airbnb or something similar, but that segment might be quite big for, for some of the hotels. Well, I, saw, I saw a statistic on a recent research from Focusrite that said that 35% that, uh, of the people then, then uh, is choosing an Airbnb accommodation is looking at a luxury property before. Right. And 40% is, look, is looking at a four-star hotel. Yeah. So it will impact, I think, our our. I our think so. And, and, that, and the, second, the second point on that is then, as this starts to settle and becomes more popular, you'll also see more of the regulations, more of the policies that are, and the taxation and similar that apply to the hotels are going to apply to these type of home share uh, channels. So this, the, the balance will come back a little bit. It's still something I think hotels need to continue to think about, but it's something new that's kind of rocking the market, but there'll be some stabilization happening over the next few years. What's the opinion of Duet on, on, on home share? Uh, so I'll, I'll use some, I guess, statistics on Airbnb. Uh, December in New York City is the highest ADR month for the New York City market. Um, in 2014, relative to 2013, was the first time ever that December year over year was down relative to the last year. And that's because Airbnb supply has been going up throughout that market over the past five years. What ends up happening is that during really high compression times when hotels generally go great, it's New Year's, it's Christmas, we can really ramp up the rates. That's when customers are now thinking of alternative booking options. So I think more so than anything, you know, Airbnb still has a lot of limitations in regards to instant booking, brand consistency, a lot of reasons why customers still book at hotels, but it's a very viable option when rates are you know, 500 euros a night during peak periods of time, if you could find an you know, equal Airbnb for significantly cheaper. Do we have any, any other question from the floor? We don't. Uh, the last question, you, you reply all three. Uh, the next big player on the market, Andrew, in, in the online market. As a website? As a website. It's booking. Booking, still booking. Um, I think it's more the Googles of the world or, or these that control your mobile devices. I don't know if Apple's going to get into it, but Googles, Amazons, those kind of are going to get bigger and bigger. And the OTAs are going to have their niche and their type of market, but having that on your mobile, Google is going to start to take more control of that, not just Google, but some so of the other So who is controlling Facebook. the mobile market will, uh, so it could be Apple, we don't know. Nathaniel, what do you think? Uh, Facebook owns Oculus Rift, the virtual reality software. I think in the next 10 years, virtual reality, you know, instead of going to TripAdvisor and looking at pictures, all of a sudden you can put on your virtual reality headset and be in the middle of the property. You can look at the room that you're going to book. You can make the booking directly on your virtual reality headset. So I think now, you know, virtual reality is still at its infant stages. Facebook owns the largest virtual reality platform, and I think that is going to take everyone away from looking at pictures to immediately just be able to immerse themselves in the property and make the booking directly in their virtual reality world. Right. By the way, the next on stage is Google, so you have to stay there and listen to them. Thank you. This was really a nice, Thank nice you. panel and nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.